Hi, this is Jamie Shoke, and most of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight, we're looking at time and language. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. When you start getting into the hardcore world building, you're going to start wanting to deal with some really interesting concepts. And a lot of those weird, the really weird concepts are in the area of the culture. That is, what kind of scale of time does the group have? You know, what holidays are important to them? Are they still basically set up on like Earth time where we're we're still coming out of our basically an agricultural era, so we're still basically worried about times when you lay down the crops and when you harvest them. I mean, seriously, you bet you can't name a single Earth culture where they have some major holidays in spring that are you know involving life and rebirth and you know things coming out of the ground. Versus, say, you know, harvest time when you, well, are picking up the crops and where things are basically going into the ground. You know, we have a lot of death-based holidays in the fall. What would happen, though, if we had a group that was so technological-based that they no longer had any idea about the agricultural aspect out in term, you know, outside of extremely general like concepts? You know, what kind of, and on top of that, and we're still dealing with people that are, have our basic same sense of time. You know, I'm European. I have no problem dealing with minutes and seconds because, you know, I have a lot of stuff that I build schedules around. You know, it's not that, it's actually sort of difficult for me not to look at a TV schedule every so often and plan what I'll be watching that night. And that's even with the event of the DVR. What happens if you have a society that's based on... Let's say we had a group of immortal trees. Would they deal with even so much as, you know... Would they even deal with hour, minutes and seconds? How about hours? Would they even deal with days beyond... You know, this is sun, this is night. Would they deal with anything earlier than, say, a month? Heck, how about a season? Odds are they'd have one that's more based on terms of... Years, decades generations even millennia you know a culture is defined on how it perceives time in a lot of ways on top of that there's language in general you can tell a lot about society by what kind of level of language use they have compare say you know nowadays where we're pretty much blunt as far as what we're trying to get across you know if I want straight up, if I want insurance, I'll be saying straight up, how do I acquire insurance? This is supposed to say Vikings who had a very flowery language. And then you basically have to allow for some interesting cultural issues. For example, Japan actually has a verb tense that's based off of nothing but honorifics. And that's perfectly fine for Japan. It's based a lot on face. So, you know, when we start looking at a lot of the cultural fun, we not only have to look at how they use language, but it also helps us figure out what's important to that person. And, of course, we can also, looking in more general terms, tell not only where that person is from, but also where a little bit of history of where that person's group comes from. I mean, when we start looking at people looking at Africa, coming from Africa, it's not just because we have, you know, anthropological proof there, but we also have cultural proof, and the fact that we have a lot of languages that have a lot of similarities, we call them Indo-European, and they include a lot of languages, and we can actually backtrack a lot of our languages all the way back to Africa in terms of mapping them in terms of the years, so... In short, language can tell a lot about a person as well as that person's group. As such, when we look at, start looking at hardcore world building, it's not necessarily a bad idea to start looking at how they tell time and, in a more general sense, how they talk. Before you get going on what exactly units of time you actually use, take a step back and 
see if they're actually important to the group in question. I'm sort of pointing this out because, well, I'm European, obviously. I sort of point that out because it means that when I start looking at time, you know, I, there's a lot of times I use actual, you know, this is on at this time as an actual, or this is happening at this time as something that's actually important. We're looking at bus schedules, for example. You know, every mo every time I have to go to a nearby town, I know that I have to catch a bus at, you know, five minutes till the hour. If I'm there later than that, odds are I miss the bus. You know, if I'm looking at, you know, scheduling my evening's entertainment, you know, on the TV, all of a sudden looking at, you know, visualizing that particular time is going to be all sorts of important. And yeah, there are certain shows that aggravate me because they're consistently running a little bit over. You know, even in DVR, it's still important to have a general idea of how to work a schedule. Also, when you're looking at scientific development, well, look at how much stuff, you know, we measure in terms of, say, even nanoseconds. We have a lot of stuff that's in very, very small periods of time. And if we start dealing with comic book geekdom, it gets even smaller. I mean, we actually have attoseconds being thrown around. All because of how, you know, just to describe how Flash does some of the stuff he does. On the flip side, you know, there's this thing called Brazilian time I keep hearing about. You know, it's, if you're from Brazil, supposedly you're not so, you're a lot more laid back on terms of how you look at time. Same with Islanders, same with a lot of people around the, the equator, you know. If you say 9 o'clock in the morning, hey, you're going to be showing up sometime before noon. If you say noonish, you know, sometime around lunch. Could even be early afternoon, you know, so on and so forth. They're just a lot more laid back in time, and in that regard, even though the people themselves may know what minutes and seconds are, those just aren't very useful concepts for the culture in general. And yeah, I'm probably going to be ticking off somebody somewhere. But let's say we start dealing with um, a hypothetical group of immortal trees. You know? At that point, you've got to really question just our, you know, minutes, seconds, even hours, really all that really an important time for them. Heck, even will day, even will days even be important to that type of group, you know? I mean, at that point, we're starting to look more at seasons are becoming more important and we're probably looking more at decades or even centuries are going to be more or less their medium period of time. Anything shorter than that really doesn't matter to them. On the flip side, they may deal with incredibly long periods of time. You know, whatever happens to be meaningful to that particular culture. You know, obviously if we're looking at, say, a fantasy realm, you know, at that point we're going to be on so-called Brazil time. You know, it's not important that you show up at precisely 9.37 in the morning, just so long as you're some, there sometime in the morning. You know, showing up late really isn't going to be all that important. Aggravating, sure, because you don't want to keep other people waiting, especially if they're a lot more powerful than you are and they don't mind killing people. You know? Comedy? Whatever you need to make things funny. But on the flip side, if you're dealing with somebody who's a lot more technological advanced, at that point you're going to get beginning down into some very detailed time systems. All I'm saying is that when you start defining your periods of time, look at what is going to be a very short period of time for that particular group. For most of us, we're looking at, you know, seconds. Short, stuff that's going to be sort of important, but definitely going to be something worth tracking. Minutes, for example. You're going to want something that's a little bit more medium. This is where we start getting into hours. When we start looking at long periods of time, days, 
weeks, even months. And of course, when we start looking at extremely long periods of time, you know, we're looking at years, decades, generations, centuries, millennia. You generally get the idea really quick. In essence, you're trying to figure out what period of time you're going to need to break it down for your particular group in order to work well. And you can then, after that, you're going to have to figure out what to call them. I mean, you've got lots of choices. Balstar Galactica, for example, and Farscape are two really good ones. Work is really fun, of course, is where you start having to define things in terms of cultural issues. With Farscape, for example, it wasn't just important to break the time down into measurable amounts, but also to break it down so they could be more applied to a more universal scale. That is, the peacekeepers didn't just have to worry about their one little culture, but they also had to worry about spending this across the galaxy, or at least attempting to. As such, they had to define those periods of time pretty well, and so that way everybody could be on the same basic time measurements. This, of course, gets really weird in a lot of places because, well, you've got a lot of places where time is all sorts of wonkers. But, in general, you have to sort of keep in mind that when we start looking at the cultural aspect of time, not only are we looking at what periods of time are relevant to the particular group, but also why they have to set those particular situations in mind. And with peacekeepers, we definitely have to keep in mind that they are applying this on a universal scale so that, or even, you know, even the Federation. You know, those, that, those star dates they give out, they have to be in more of a universal time rather than tied to a specific planet. So, relative to that, you're going to be wanting to figure out either if you want to go strictly, you know, like we do with, um, Earth time, which is where we define the day of the month, the month and the year, or shifting all that into a particular numerical unit, like star date time. So, which is a little bit weird, but just trust me, when you start playing around with period time, you're going to want to know how to mark it as much, so much as to measure it. I mean, anybody can measure a second. But we also have to keep in mind that when we start measuring this stuff and we start comparing it to other people, we have to have some way of comparing it to what other people know. So yeah, when you start defining exactly what time, so when you start defining exactly what your units are, also keep in mind that you also have to figure out a way how to mark that time. It's, you know, it just goes hand in hand. Strictly as a character note, how a character measures time is going to be sort of interesting and defines a lot about that person as well. Consider European versus American ways of measuring, I'm sorry, of marking dates. Uh, most Europeans will do the day of the month, the month, and then the year versus the American, which is to do the month, the day, and the, uh, the year. And I'm sure there's somewhere out there there's somebody who does the year first, then the month, then the day, or some other method. That's fine. Like I said, it's just going to tell you a lot about that person. All right, next up. Now you've got everything. Now you know how you're basically measuring and marking time. Let's look at seasons. When we start looking at seasons, we're not necessarily talking about the astronomical ones. You know, summer, spring, winter, fall. Just to mess with you. You'll notice I gave it reversed. But we're also looking at, depending on the culture, we could also be looking at migratory schedules. If we're dealing with a group of cetaceans, for example, they're going to obviously not necessarily look at in terms of seasons the way everybody else does. They're going to look at seasons in terms of when they have to migrate from one area to another. You know? They do would do summer off of California, go up north during the spring. They could be back down to the other side of the earth by winter. You know, it's just they're not defining it in terms of 
because they are predatory animals, they're not necessarily going to define it in terms of straight astrological or sorry astronomical seasons like the rest of us would. Um, and again, I point out that we have a lot of stuff that we do in terms of agriculture. You know, there's entirely possible that a group could measure things in terms of how they have to grow their plants. You know, they know this season is the a very short season would be the initial growing season, possibly even defined as the first growing season. Then they'd have a second growing season or where they have to maintain the plants. They'd have a harvest season and then they would have a fallow season. I mean, obviously, it's going to be a little analogous to how we would think of astronomical seasons, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their seasons are going to be defined by where the sun is at particular points. Rather, it's going to be looking at, you know, what kind of temperature the place has gotten to. And these are not always consistent year to year. You know, we know as when we start looking at actual historical records and all that, we start noticing that, you know, winter has not always been the same amount of time. Even if we consider, say, December, January, and February the winter months, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything actually on the planet. You know, we could be having incredibly gorgeous summer weather starting in February, or for that matter, not having to deal with snow at all. Just because we call them the winter months doesn't necessarily mean they have to have applied anything real. And if we're dealing with a group that's wholly based on an agricultural situation, you know, they're going to be worried more about the practical than the theoretical. You know what I mean? And then, of course, if we're really talking weird, some races probably wouldn't even worry about the astrological or the ag agricultural so much as well as their personal breeding seasons. Obviously, I'm not referring specifically to, you know, defining a breeding season as this is the season where we breed, but throughout the entire year. Or for that matter, group of years. You know, if you know, I'm looking at a group of cats in the wild and a lot of, a lot of mammals and a lot of other um, groups can only breed during particular times of the year, especially if we're talking plants. So if we're dealing with a group of plants that's based off of, say, a perennial concept, but they still have to worry about, you know, days and months type of deal, then odds are they're going to be worried about, you know, stuff when... They can start spreading their seed when they have to protect their young plants as they grow up and even to a certain degree when they have to go dormant. All of that would technically be a breeding season. You know, however, I'm just trying to point out that when it comes down to defining the seasons, you don't have to be stuck in the usual, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall situation. You can have a lot of fun and define your seasons as you need to to better define your cultures. Just an interesting something to play around with. And of course, while you're dealing with all these big time issues, you know, you're going to be dealing with I just realized let's throw an academic in there just to be really obnoxious. Obviously, if you have some of these, you know, if you have an academic type of situation, you know, we're talking students or we're talking teachers, let's get real. How many of us define the year, at least in terms of seasons, when it came down to what was going on at school? You know, we define football season was normally what we think of as fall because the big highlight would basically be the football games and the initial dances. Winter, lots of holidays, a lot more laid back, but also a lot more intense because of the, the tests and all that are going on. Spring, you know, more of a thing of a baseball season more than we would, 
the street straight linear you know astrological springs months at that point we're looking more at you know like you said stuff like baseball where we're looking at we're just trying to get back into being more physical you know distractions and do distractions due to romance that sort of thing and of course having a summer off so again we have sort of an academic thing more than an astrate astronomical thing just something to think about when it comes to holidays things get all sorts of weird um obviously you're looking at stuff like seasonal have you ever noticed how there's not a whole lot of holidays during the summer that's because there's not really a whole lot of reason to be you know a lot of holidays during the summer we want to get away far away from everybody else that we possibly can and just go off and do our own thing as much as possible because we know we're going to be back when it gets a lot colder holidays bring us together so obviously during the months we don't want to be around the people hey have you noticed there's not a whole lot of holidays during the summer but when we do get together all of a sudden we see a whole lot of holidays and when we start doing, seeing important things that have to happen during those particular areas there's a lot of applicable holidays again holidays tend to bring people together and that's something you need to keep in mind when it comes to your cultures when do your when does your culture need to come together and think about this for a sec the biggest social holiday of the year are harvest you know Halloween which used to be basically when everything but he got together to get the harvest done and over with major holiday major group major event Christmas or whatever you want to call the summer or sorry the winter solstice event you know we've got a lot of people that have just a couple months ago gotten together done something major all of a sudden we need not a bad idea to get together a couple of months later to get stock of each situation maybe have a little bit of holiday to set off against the gloom and you know it's just a great time to get everybody together and it's definitely going to have some interesting issues if we're talking a farming community because it is the shortest day of the year wouldn't it be sort of cool to say hey we already survived the shortest day of the year together so we're expecting a whole new year spring oh yeah we definitely want to get together during the spring you have all the romantic issues you've had people that have been stuck in their houses for a couple of months all of a sudden they want to get out they want to meet people and not necessarily for business related issues there there's some definite romance in the air and notice how we've got a couple of holidays in the fall a couple during the winter usually legal type stuff and then we have a ridiculous number of holidays when that spring hits so yeah and have you noticed that fall we need to be together winter we sort of want to get together and spring oh they definitely want to get together so you know those are our seasonal holidays throw into that we'll also have religious holidays you know these are usually sprinkled throughout the year that observe certain details and if you want to we can also point out that they're also historical as well I mean we're just talking basically arbitrary days that everybody gets together and does a little bit of a celebration or only groups of people get together to celebrate you know in America, July 4th is definitely an area of people to get together to celebrate, but it's just, it's totally arbitrary. Same with the President's holidays, as well as a few other incredible celebrities like Martin Luther King Day. We're still, to be, we're still working out Columbus Day, but you get the idea. There's a lot of days where people just simply get together because, well, they've traditionally gotten together then. They're not major holidays. They're they're still sort of important. And if we're looking at religions, well, consider Passover for 
you know, Christians and Jews. You've got the month of Ramadan for Muslims. And, you know, you generally see a lot of celebrating throughout the year in terms of straight religion. All of this is actually sort of pretty cool, and there's actually reasons for it. So it's just sort of interesting, you know, check out Ramadan. It's usually during a period of time when people can get away with, you know, not having to worry about hunger. I mean, it's basically a month of fasting. So, of course, it's going to be during a month when we don't really have to worry about um, hunger. Or, for that matter, people attacking us. Can you imagine what would happen if you decided to go after a group that was fasting during the day? Of course, once night hit, you'd pretty much be against some frenzied rushing, but, you know. It's just when you start looking at the holidays, try to key them into something that's either of cultural significance or their strategic reasons for doing so. Again, harvest, great time to get people together because you need a lot of bodies to get those plants off the ground as quickly as possible. Spring, you want a lot of bodies together. Okay, so first off, you're going to want them to get together just to plant the seeds. But once that's done, hey, you're going to want to do a lot of romancing. And of course, if you have an area where you, people just simply don't want to be together, like during the summer, you're also not going to see a lot of holidays during that particular season. Again, just weirdness, but, you know, this applies to a lot of major events as well. You know, if you've got a group of dwarves that is trying to celebrate Moradin's birthday, obviously that's going to be a major get-together. Um, elves and their archery contests. The cruel, you know, is their bigger stereotype. It's not that hard to see that elves would get together during time and, you know, the weather is incredible and declare a holiday that they basically just start shooting off against each other. trees. Obviously there's going to be a lot of holidays set up, you know, when they all... Okay, so trees don't usually tend to get together a whole lot. But if they did, they'd probably choose something that was hot weather, lots of sunshine, or at the other extremes, they needed to get together for defense. You know, obviously winter's going to be a big thing. Just consider whenever you start setting up your holidays, there has to be a cultural reason for that particular holiday. Also, if your group is known for doing war during the summer, and there's just no, virtually no war during, or fights during the winter, well, obviously you'll have a lot of war-type holidays during the summer and not so much during the winter. It's just, you know, you've got to your culture and define the holidays depending on when they have important things going on. In short, when it comes down to your time, figure out something where you're going some sort of measuring and marking system that's important to the to the culture and keep in mind cultural issues. Um, seasons. Don't be afraid to ignore the astronomical seasons and define your seasons however works best for your particular culture. And last but not least, if you're going to define holidays, they're going to come down to areas or days of the month or the sorry days of the year when you need to get a lot of people together, when people want to get together, and just important dates throughout the calendar. And just have some sort of I guess I better go back on measuring marking for just a sec because. You're going to basically want to figure out if you do happen to clump them into bit bigger groups, like we do with, say, weekdays and months, you're going to want to figure out some sort of naming strategy. In Europe, we tend to default to, for some strange reason, Viking days of the week and Latin month names. Go figure. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to name them after particular groups, Pantheon or their line of emperors, but just whatever tends to work for you. Um, a lot of fantasy calendars, for example, tend to name the, you know, do real boring first day, second day, third day, whatever. 
And when it comes to month, the month usually describes what usually happens during that month. You know, this is a month of rain. Because for the next 30 days, we will be getting nothing but rain. The month of wonders. Because lots of weird magical stuff happens. You get the idea. Yeah, like you didn't think I was going to cover that for some reason. But just have fun with how you name your weeks and how you define, or sorry, how you define your weekday and how you define your months. And if you want to define your years, give them really fun names. Try to think of something that actually works for naming them. But that should cover you as far as time. When it comes to languages, all right. First off, before we get going, let's define some terms just so we're on the same page more than because I know I'm going to give you the exact right term for this. Language families. These are families that are closely linked. And we're not just talking like, say, your Indo-European languages where it's a general classification, but Romance languages, for example. Um, language is a group, is a language talked by or spoken by a particular group. It has dialects and it has accents. Accents are usually geographical based, but generally speaking, they're how a, if you have speaker A, speaker B, and they both say the exact same word, we're looking at how the difference between the two words is said. The American aluminum versus the British aluminium. For example, and that's as far as I'm going to try to go as far as that goes. Dialect are essentially two languages spoken in the same basic language, but they may have differences. If you're American, you know the difference between, say, I going with abonics just because everybody has general you know, better feel for abonics than A, V, E. Um, we're also looking at vowel speak from the 80s, surfer lingo, you know, the difference between, say, somebody from Georgia and somebody from Oregon. They're speaking the same language, the same basic, but they're, they have certain words and certain issues that are entirely different. If you really want to see an interesting idea as far as dialects go, look at pop versus soda. In essence, it's the same language, slightly different words, slightly different concepts. And like I said, accent is just it's spoken differently. Same like words, usually, it's just the pronunciation gets all sorts of wonk. What you're going to do is when you start playing around with languages, is that it's going to get all sorts of weird really quick. And I mean really, really weird, really, really quick. Different groups are going to emphasize different words. I mean, there's always the, you know, you've got the Inuit tribe and there's supposed to, you know, 50-something different words for snow and ice. Yeah, I know it's a more urban legend than anything else, but the key here is that Supposedly because snow and ice are so important to them that they basically differentiate into a lot of different ways. In fact, a lot of those words have infiltrated over to regular English and have really helped in a lot of weird ways. If you have a group that's heavily into fish, then they're probably going to have a lot of different names for pretty much every fish that's out there and break down the body parts pretty much the same way. I have no doubt that if we had a group that, you know, there's a group that breaks down sunny days pretty much the same way. It's just not a clear sunny day. It's a hot sun, clear sunny day or a sully hazy sunny day. You get the idea. Whatever you define as important is going to have a lot of expressions relative to that in the language. Conversely, stuff that's not so important, probably not. If you have a group, for example, that doesn't have to worry about snow, they're probably going to have one or two words for it, and that's as far as their concern is good. It's not something they encounter on an even yearly basis, so why should they really have a name for it? 
And at this point, I'm purposely going to be starting making fun of the English. And this time around, it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm an American. It's just because, well, English has a lot of weirdness as far as languages go. That, if you're really interested in breaking down languages, you need to start looking at. Uh, let me back up half a step and go to Japan for a second. Um, Japan is sort of interesting because they have an entire verb tense of how to deal with different people in terms of if you deal with somebody who's higher in the state than you in terms of status, you use that verb tense. If you have somebody who's lower than you are, you have that verb tense. Which makes sense because Japan is heavily stratified in terms of economic status. So it sort of makes sense that the language would be stratified as well. Just to show you some of the weird, one of the weird ways you can do with English. Or sorry, you can have with language. Alright, back to England. Hmm, debating. Let me do one more stop off because when we get going on England, it's just going to be full bore. Uh, Viking language is worth noting because they have a lot of what they call kinnings. And while you see a lot of these in other languages, well, with Vikings, you pretty much had the entire language was built off of them. What you're looking at is that you have a lot of metaphorical words that basically stand in for other words and tend to represent themselves a lot in the art. Vikings were well known for their incredibly long poems, the Eddas, and because of that, they also had a ridiculous number of ways of expressing themselves on things. The sea, for example, wasn't just the sea or the ocean, it was also the Wells Road. Um, knives and swords were, you know, uh, teeth and fangs, as well as claws were occasionally used. It's just that you had all these really great metaphors for pretty much everything, and that expressed themselves into it. If you're trying to basically have somebody who's really flowery with their language and has a lot of artistic and creative spirit, you might want to look into using a lot of kinnings. It's going to aggravate your readers, may even tick off your other characters, but it's a really fun way of just having fun with it. All right, now we get to have fun with England. And by England, I don't mean England, I mean the United Kingdom. My apologies for that. What you're going to find out is on that particular island group of nations that there's a lot of weirdness as far as the language goes. Not only do you have, you know, languages that are slightly different and just slightly different that you actually need a translator. For this, I will point you out to the classic scene from Super Fuzz, where you've got one person translating into Welsh or sorry, translating from the Welsh to another language and then into English. And you actually need a translator, even though Welsh is pretty much of just a variation of Brit British. You've got some really old tongues in the area. You've got Gaelic, for example, um, which is its own language. It actually predates you know, it predates Roman times. British was actually not brought into it until it was actually more a byproduct of Germanic and Latin to a lot to a certain degree. So you actually had some languages that were already here and then got mixed into it and it just gets all sorts of weird. But like I said, you've got all these different Dialects that are just far enough apart from the main English branch that you need actual translators, like Welsh. You've got languages that are older and just do all sorts of weirdness with the Gaelic. And that's before we start looking at the social economic status. You know, there's no way you're going to confuse somebody who speaks Cockney, which is pretty much the lower class English, versus... High English, which is spoke by the nobles in the, the crust. 
it gets to a point where you sometimes actually do need a translator, but you can get general gist. It's not just an accent. Even though, of course, obviously that's a good part of it. Making these a little bit more interesting is that you then have specialist languages. We're looking at your Kent. We're looking at your jargon. If we, you've got with Kant, it's sort of a really weird one because it's an ultra-specialist language that, while it has a lot of jargonistic accent, um, a lot of jargonistic aspects to it, it also has a lot of more general thing and becomes its own weird language. I'll bet really specialized. On Dungeons and Dragons, we have a thing called Thieves' Kant that is spoken specifically by thieves and describes is something like a couple hundred words of situations that deal specifically with thieves. Yeah, we actually, it's actually derived uh, from the way a lot of the, the underworld is supposed to speak. Stereotypically, yeah, but you know. All the way to, uh, if we were talking to a medical doctor, they're not just going to simply say you've got a headache, they're actually going to break it down a lot more than that and call headaches different things depending on how it breaks down. Mechanics, the same basic difference. You know, seeing isn't just a spanner or a wrench. It's, you know, they're going to detail out what the wrench is actually used for, plus its size. You know, you're talking, on top of that, they're not just simply going to talk, take, you know, you rotate something, you're going to ro torque it. General rule is, is that when you get a group of people together, they're going to have specialize in language relative to their particular use. When you start dealing with your cans, your jargons, so on and so forth, again, it's another way of defining a particular culture just as much as Cockney or High English is going to define an Englishman. If you have somebody who's going to be heavy into fixing things, they're going to have very specific language. Remember what I said earlier, that the more important something is, the more words you're going to have to it? Well, when you start dealing with somebody who's talking in a jargonistic language, yeah, you're going to find out that there's 57 words for wrench in like two seconds flat. Alright, so let's go a little bit old school, specifically English history. As English became a lot more infamous, for, or a lot more famous across dealing with different areas, well, you all of a sudden got a lot of weird little dialects called Pidgin. All the Pidgin is is a mix of two different languages that are created specific for a specific use of uh, communication. That is, while the two languages pretty much stay separate, they have just enough joining that a speaker of the Pidgin can get his point across to somebody who speaks the other language. The reigning example, as far as pigeon goes, is Swahili, which was created specifically by the Dutch traders. I'm always going to get this one wrong, but it was created by the Dutch traders so they could basically deal with the African tribes as they met them. Eventually, this would become their own, become well a trade language of the African tribes and take on certain aspects of their own. But the bottom line is. Swahili is ultimately a pidgin language between Dutch and African. Um, it was just created because, well, obviously the Dutch would have a major problem communicating in the African language, which was pretty much clicks and whistles at the time. And you notice the same thing, though, when you start going over to the Pacific, because you all of a sudden have a lot of people that are, you know, speaking a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and not really speaking a whole lot of both. Pigeon is really great for getting the, basically the point across, but may not be able to hold, language, you know, it's not a complete language. That is, it doesn't deal well with metaphorical concepts. In other words, it probably isn't going to be able to describe a sunset very well, but if you need to basically figure out how many fish you're trading for how many coconuts, not a problem. So... The basic gist here is, well, 
And that's no, and you, so you basically get the idea. When you start looking at any particular group, you're going to see a lot of weirdness. You're going to see dialects that sometimes need some serious translating in of themselves as far as the main tongue goes. You're going to have people that are speaking different tongues because, well, the social status has evolved over time. England is obviously not as advanced as, say, Japan is, but that's because in Japan you had a reason for those stratifications to exist. That is, you had a group of untouchables, you had a group of lower class, you had the middle class, such as it was, and then you had the ruling class. And none of them pretty much wanted to deal with, do anything with the other. So it makes sort of sense that there would be some stratification in the language as well. But every language has that. Japan just simply takes it to another level with having different actual verb tenses depending on who you're dealing with. Again, compare Cockney with High English. Um, over time, certain areas are going to develop their own languages. They're important based, based on what's important to that particular group. And over time, these languages may diverge enough that, well, you need a translator. Again, Welsh and regular Brit regular English. Um, you know, you see evolution of language happen all the time. It's slowed down a little bit thanks to the printing press, as well as TV to a certain degree, but trust me, there's still a lot of evolution going on. If you really want to see somebody go a little bit on the deep board, Find somebody who goes with the old Latin ver definition of uh, decimate versus the more modern version of decimate. Yeah, I know. Changing over languages, definitions is more of the, a little bit of it. But, you, you know, you get the idea. You're going to have language will evolve. And between different groups, it will be more and more focused based on what's important to that particular group. What this means to you as a writer, obviously, is that you can define a person better by making their language a lot more unique to that particular individual, that particular person's very specific culture. So just because character A and character B are both speaking perfectly fine English, they may not be able to communicate with each other because their outlook is so specialized. Which means that you as a writer have to figure out a way to either find common ground or a translator. Which can get in and of itself, which can make things all sorts of fun in and of itself. The so basically just when it comes to language and defining languages is that whereas you can basically have all sorts of fun in terms of defining verbs, predicates, conjunctions, and so on and so forth, we're not interested in that. If you want to do that kind of stuff, go take a class on linguistics. What's important for our purposes is that we're looking at a way how to define a person. How that person measures time helps define that person more than knowing precisely how much, you know, a second or a minute is. Yeah, I know the scientific definition of both of those. It doesn't mean, however, that I'm going to use them in everyday language. Um, you know... They just, those specific definitions relative to our conversation as far as defining culture don't really hold all that much important. Just realize that when you start defining language between your two characters, that if you are going to create your own language for each individual group, that each group will tend to focus in on what that important to that particular group. And over time, languages, even areas that are relatively close to each other, will evolve to be entirely different over a great period of time. You know, you can either have these uh, big a group, at, big uh, gorge as, say, English and Welsh. Or, for that matter, if you really want to throw things weird, throw in some Gaelic. We know Gaelic actually predates everybody else as far as that particular island goes. But, hey. You know, and it's just so you could actually have a group that's been in the area for a ridiculous amount of time and now all of a sudden 
somebody's actually interested in trying to talk that language for whatever reason. So, this creates its own conflicts because obviously you're going to need to figure out how to translate. You know, if you're trying to solve a riddle that's put into ancient Siberian, you're going to have to figure out a way to learn some ancient Siberian. And you get the general gist. Just figure out what's important to the person and that will help you define how they tell time and how they talk. Sometimes poorly, as I'm doing today. But, you know, it's just something to have fun with. It'll help, it really helps to find your character when you can tell the difference between, say, a scientist person and somebody who's off the street. Because one of them's talking in high-tech jargon and one of them's talking in hardcore cockney. And it'll drive people crazy, but hey, it'll help you as a writer better differentiate between those two. And once you've differentiated between the two, it's going to be incredible stuff when it actually comes out writing. So, have fun with it, and have a good day.